It's my pleasure to introduce the two speakers of today. Uh, the first will be Nasser. He is a colleague based here at the uh, Department of Development Studies and the current, current project uh, coordinator of NOVOR. And he is also a co-founder of the Syrian Center for Policy Research. And our second speaker today is Omar Dahi. Omar Dahi is Associate Professor of Economics at Hampshire College in the US. And he is uh, the co-founder of Security in Context. Both speakers will have about um, 15 to 20 minutes. And then we will open the discussion for the broader audience. Um, please be mindful that you have to wear FFP2 masks during the event and when we have the discussion you can take it off to ask questions. Thank you so much and I give the floor to um, the two of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, thank you very much Claudia and I guess I'm going to start first. Uh, before I start I wanted to thank uh, the NOAA program, the Devo Development Studies Department, and the Syrian Center for Policy Research for hosting me here in Vienna. It's really uh, a pleasure to be here and to collaborate uh, with, with you on behalf of the Security in Context Initiative. The Security in Context Initiative uh, was started uh, about two years ago to respond to the ongoing and everlasting uh, militarization and securitization of uh, various regions that we conduct research in, uh, particularly in the Middle East, but also elsewhere in the Global South, and to think collaboratively, collaboratively with other institutions about how we can build alternatives, alternative policies, alternative frameworks, and alternative uh, narratives about uh, moving towards a more just, uh, just societies and just planet. So I'd like to thank Claudia, Helmut, and, and Maria in particular for organizing my visit. Uh, it's my first time in Vienna, so it's a pleasure to be here, and I particularly appreciate all of you coming out today in what is, I understand, a holiday stretch or a time off, so I particularly appreciate it. With that, uh, I'd like to mention a few remarks that try to orient the discussion a little bit about understanding the status quo or understanding where we are in the Syrian conflict in order to also think about alternatives, and I think both of you and I were discussing yesterday night that we all we want to be uh, hopeful and we want to lead the discussion towards thinking uh, about alternatives uh, to move forward given the hopelessness and despair that marks a lot of the discussions and the reality about Syria. And hopefully we can do that and hopefully we can think together because I know many people in the audience here have experiences uh, and research and activism and practitioner sort of involvement in, in Syria and also other, other regions actually that, that went through uh, various uh, conflicts and struggles. Uh, the first point I want to make is, is in order to do, to do that and get to a point of thinking about um, the alternatives, I want to try and think about what it means to provide a, a comprehensive framework for understanding the conflict and lay out some of the elements of this framework. But I wanted to start with the promise of the social movement that erupted in Syria in 2011 and what to me marked the most or among the most important aspects of that social movement which of course not just happened in Syria, but happened in other countries as well, but uh, particularly if we focus on Syria. And uh, one of its greatest achievements, with, which I describe almost as a miracle, which is that it provided the promise of reviving or starting political life in Syria. One of the greatest uh, crimes or one of the greatest uh, tragedies of the past uh, 30, 40 years before 2010 was the systematic killing of politics, killing of political life in Syria, uh, the possibilities for orga organizing, the possibilities for independent advocacy, the possibilities for Syrians to take the initiative to advocate on, on their own behalf, to advocate and, and uh, provide policies and frameworks and visions uh, to their future and have societal discussions and dialogue uh, about that about that future. And I think um, this is something to keep in mind, I think, when we're thinking not just about um, that moment, but also the trajectory of the conflict in comparison, for example, with other countries where that had some margin of, of political life. So I think that was one of the most hopeful aspects of that moment, is that the social movement that started uh, provided an opening, a space for 
reviving political life. Uh, and in many ways went towards starting uh, a process where political alternatives might be formulated uh, at the political, social, and economic level. On the other hand, however, if we also look back at this time period, we'll say that that space for political life or possibilities of politics closed fairly quickly, uh, not just in Syria, but, but other places, but particularly in Syria through uh, the various aspects of the trajectory of the conflict, most notably militarization and the violence, which really marked uh, uh, and has marked Syrian society in, in the last decade. Um, and I go back to a quote that uh, was said by a, a fairly prominent um, Pakistani uh, journalist and activist, revolutionary activist. His name was Iqbal Ahmad. And he taught in the institution where I teach, uh, Hampshire College. He has a very famous essay called uh, Revolutionary Warfare, How to Tell When the Rebels Have Won. And he argued that the, the victory of rebellion, the victory of a, a radical social movement, an alternative social movement, is not in defeating the enemy militarily, but in out-administering the enemy, out-administering the status quo. So when the rebels are uh, able to out-administer, provide an alternative governance framework and program that attracts the mass, a critical mass of the population, that's when you know you're succeeded or on the path to success. And I think if we ask the question of have uh, the social movements and the various aspects in terms of the institutionalized versions of the oppositions uh, in Syria, uh, uh, the various initiatives, have they been successful in providing this alternative? And I would say no. And this is how I approach what I label as the failures of the opposition movements, not just in Syria, but in the region, in, in, uh, throughout the region, is the failure of the opposition movements to provide and to create uh, the possibilities of organizing or discussion about alternative economic, political, social model that can really provide this basis for uh, the new Syria, for, for the Syria that we want, uh, or the other countries in, in the region. And I don't want to uh, fault simply the, the opposition itself. Uh, there, there are broader factors that go into this. Um, there's a bigger global discussion about what, are, what is an alternative development model, for example, to neoliberalism mean? What are the available models that one can actually take up, uh, not just economic, but a model for social justice? What, what are the... the uh, practices and experiences that we can draw on that provide inspiration to this. So there's a vast, um, there's a bigger discussion to be had to, to think about this failure or to think about this lack of alternative that was created. But when we get to the point of discussing, you know, where do we want to go from here, I think that's something to keep in mind uh, because I think that program should be considered a long-term struggle for such realization rather than uh, a short-term uh, program that, that is connected to a specific policy or a specific change uh, that may or may not be necessary, but yet doesn't actually answer the question of what is the vision uh, moving forward. So with those two remarks in mind, I want to talk about some aspects that I think uh, provide an understanding of the landscape of conflict, what I, what I call the landscape of conflict in Syria and its neighborhood. And the landscape of conflict, uh, drawing on a lot of the peace and conflict research, whether practitioner or academic research, uh, there's often in Syria, and not just in Syria, but elsewhere, there's a lot of confusion, a lot of narratives, debating narratives or competing narratives about uh, the conflict, the nature of the conflict, the root causes, the dynamics, what are the grievances, what is really at stake in terms of the different issues that need to be addressed. So this is my attempt to, to think about um, basically providing a, a framework for understanding the, the landscape of conflict. And what I argue is that understanding the framework requires uh, understanding structural and enabling factors. Structural factors are factors that are uh, you can say are given in the, in the short run that are hard to change in the short run or that um, uh, require the cooperation of multiple actors. They can't be reduced to the actions of one single actor because uh, they're too intractable to be solved. 
the, uh, in the short run. They may be solved in the long run if there are policies that are adopted to actually uh, improve uh, or, or cooperate on, on those specific issues. And the, the, the structural factors, in my opinion, are number one, the balance of powers, the balance of power in Syria today, which is the presence of, uh, of course, the Syrian government and its allies, Russia and Iran, the Turkish uh, uh, military and political presence inside the country uh, in, in, in the north of Syria, northeast, the, U, the presence of the US and, and uh, other uh, political, uh, uh, what you can call, quote unquote, uh, Kurdish affiliated militias. Uh, and, and armed groups and political formulations. Uh, that's the balance of power that provides the hard boundaries for understanding uh, you know, what, what is shaping, what are the contours shaping Syria today. So understanding the dynamics, the various interests, the various um, uh, policies of the different actors, I think is a key constraint for understanding uh, the landscape of conflict. The second factor is the broadly the economic state, the um, and that involves not just the state of human and economic development, which has radically deteriorated, and I think Rabia will mention a little bit about that aspect, uh, but also um, the nature of the war economy, the nature of the conflict economies, and how they have come to provide a sort of self-sustaining uh, logic that has moved the conflict away from perhaps its initial phases, its root causes. There are new dynamics that are at play, for example, extreme poverty, uh, and deprivations uh, that didn't exist uh, in, in 2011 that may become or may be part of drivers of conflict uh, that need to be uh, considered or taken into account. So that, that includes uh, uh, what broadly we can call the war economy or the conflict economy. And third on the economic dimension is state capacity, which is uh, what are and are the various institutions, whether the central state, uh, the so-called, uh, yeah, the, the the Syrian government or the institutions provided in other areas, what is their capacity to actually meet the needs uh, of goods and services and, and, and provision of uh, uh, economic development and, and uh, uh, social development in, in the areas under their, uh, under their rule. Uh, the third factor that needs to be taken into account are the fault lines of conflict. What are actually the, the grievances uh, that exist in Syria today? What are, what is the nature of societal relations? What is the nature of uh, relations between different sectors of Syrian society? Uh, what are the narratives out there about the question that I mentioned, which is the root causes and the dynamics of the conflict? Uh, there's a lot of discussion uh, that happens in any civil conflict about the root causes, about the dynamics, and often these discussions are actually led by political entrepreneurs, by the elites of the conflict themselves uh, that are often very partial or distortive of, of the nature of the conflict. There might be, uh, and there has been significant investment in Syria in what you can call identitarian or sectarian agitation, in, in polarization, in providing and entrenching divisions between Syrian society. And uh, perhaps if we look at the, 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 the conflict today from uh, various other lens, other than these dominant narratives, we find that the fault lines of conflict are actually not mapping out to the grand narratives that are presented about what is driving the conflict in Syria. And I think the sectarian divisions is one of these key uh, narratives that need to be really examined and, and dismantled and, and, uh, and discussed. And then there are two final points that I would say are, are also um, key structural factors. One is the, the neighborhood and the relationship with the outside world. And I think what we've seen in the past few years is significant uh, deterioration in the regional um, economic, social climate. So there are various factors that have become uh, uh, incredibly crucial for uh, the trajectory of sort of economic life in Syria, not least of which, for example, is the financial crisis that occurred in Lebanon uh, uh, two or three years ago now. Uh, which, uh, uh, at previous to the crisis, provided a sort of gateway for trade and financial exchanges, uh, as well as sustaining a significant number of, of refugees. The questions of the neighborhood, of, of course, involve the actions of um, uh, the, the regional countries, uh, Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the other Gulf states, not just vis-a-vis -vis their policies towards Syria, but towards each other. And uh, as Many of us know in, in, in um, 
here today, I think uh, it's, it's no secret that the uh, binaries which existed initially in, in the conflict no longer exist. A binary of uh, an opposition that is supported by a group of states and uh, a government that is also supported by allies. There's lots of divisions within the so-called supporters of the opposition, various uh, regional uh, sort of cleavages. And the relationship between those different actors is key to th towards thinking about you know, how that's going to actually reflect on Syria. Uh, and so all of that, then you add the other layer of, of course, great power competition and uh, its reflections on the Syrian, uh, the Syrian crisis. There's, there are US and Russian troops uh, in Syria. There was the beginning, to some extent, in the last three, four years, beginning of certain types of small agreements on and regarding humanitarian issues in Syria uh, that uh, now we're going to have to see what, what happens to that in, in light of the, uh, the invasion of Ukraine and the fallout from that. Uh, my prediction is it's not groundbreaking to think that it's going to be negative uh, in the sense uh, that rather than uh, small cooperation perhaps that can have a meaningful impact, we're going to return to the zero-sum game of the conflict. Uh, and finally, the status of the final agreement. Is there going to be a final agreement? Is it going to be based on UN Resolution 2254? Is it going to be based on elite bargains? What is the nature of that? Uh, and in the last few minutes, I want to talk about if we put those structural factors. So, so those factors that I just laid out are, in my opinion, um, factors that can't be reduced to the actions of one uh, party in the conflict. The, the, uh, the, um, the actions of the Syrian government, no matter how much it tries, for example, it's not going to have the impact on all the different actors in, in the region, right? It's not going to be decisive in reorienting Saudi Arabian, Iranian, uh, Turkish foreign policy. It takes the coordinated action of multiple actors, which, may, which obviously is why uh, a solution has been difficult. And similarly with the other parties of the conflict. Um, that said, there are other factors that are within the control of the various powers and the various actors. Policies that you could actually, if there's a political will or there's significant investment uh, in them, that can begin to provide us with thinking towards alternatives and, and a path forward. And I'll just label sort of four of those. The first is social protection. And here, social protection, I mean it in a, in a broad sense. Social protection, in the traditional sense, means economic uh, and humanitarian or economic provision to um, support people who are in dire need, who are in, in uh, uh, who are unemployed or who are, who are in, incapable of employment, uh, traditionally welfare policies, unemployment insurance, and other actions. Uh, in, in, uh, in light of conflict, and in the Syrian case in particular, I think it's useful to expand the notion of, of social protection to include non-economic factors and really think about the actual word of protection, protection from fear, protection from arbitrary arrest and disappearance, policies that actually make a significant difference in the day-to-day -day life of people um, to, to, to protect them from the daily fear that has economic and non-economic dimensions. Second are policies that have to do with the rule of law and the justice system and independent judiciary, uh, uh, you know, ways that we can actually have uh, a semblance, whether it's formal or informal systems of justice, that can really attempt to provide confidence that in whatever society, wherever region people are in, that, um, that there are non, um, non-violent uh, means of, of conflict resolution. The third are broader economic and social policies. So one of the things we've seen in the past decade, which is one of the things that Syrian Center Policy Research has documented throughout its, its various reports, is how there's been a shift from investment in human development to investment in, in militarization, of, of slashing development budgets. And basically, all policies are instrumentalized to pursue the war effort. Uh, that needs to change, that has to change if we want to sort of move out of this sort of intractability. And finally, what's going to be the external <coughs> response? What's going to be the reaction of the outside world? Is it going to be uh, one that is conducive towards supporting a positive or virtuous uh, cycle? Is it going to be one that um, uh, takes the path of least resistance that basically focuses on uh, what we're going to do is tighten sanctions and then forget about the consequences and say we've achieved something, is it going to be uh, continuing the same type of uh, uh, humanitarian aid policies? 
uh, I think the external response is going to be crucial. And I think, obviously, as I mentioned, um, there are a lot of factors at play in that, in that response. I think um, part of the reason I lay out this multi-factored landscape of conflict, which is, I think, um, uh, quite, um, uh, you know, maybe perhaps dense, uh, but, you know, in order to really move out of the status quo, we need to have an accurate diagnosis of, of the problems. What are the dynamics? And I think this is where perhaps we can move on, you know, when we come back to the, to the question of, of what is the role of civil society, what are the role of various actors that want to support this moving away from the status quo. Uh, and, and that's where we can sort of start to think about alternatives. I think I'll stop there. I've reached the 20 minutes. and am yeah. to Rabia. <coughs> Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Omar. And thank you for all of you for coming in, in the holidays. Happy Easter and Ramadan Kareem for all of you. Um, I hope you, you will enjoy the discussion today, uh, which, which, is, which is meant to be a dialogue session. We want this exchange to be, we will trigger some statements, some assumptions, some evidence, and we hope this will create uh, an in-depth discussion between us. Uh, you, are, you are lucky, I just started. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you will not regret it. <laughs> He's lucky I just finished. <laughs> um, uh, I, I will start with, um, with also with, with some uh, reflections on the framework, how we understand the conflict within the context in the region, how we build uh, and invest in a framework that not reduced our understanding for the different factors that make such complicated conflict continue for this long term. How this could be an, uh, an engine for conflict in the region and across the world since it created mechanisms, the dynamics and culture that affect different countries in the region and beyond. And so, so this is the initial understanding of the framework will give us a good, uh, I mean, a ground for the narrative to see how we see this gloomy picture about the region and Syria. So it's, we will talk about alternatives, but we will not reduce or, or try to, to make the huge accumulation of losses uh, uh, looks like uh, it's marginal or uh, underestimated. So this is the starting uh, of, of the, uh, this in my introduction. Then I will give some examples how the dynamics of con conflict economy institutionalized, developed, and make it resilience as uh, an institution that could continue for long term. How, the, how it is not just related to the military operations. And we will give some examples about the last two years in Syria, where there is a deterioration, a deep deterioration in, from political, social, and economic aspects, although we have a reduction in the military operations and the battle. So our understanding that the, the conflict is coming to the end is not real. It's the opposite. We are talking about exaggeration and uh, degradation in, in, inside Syria and, of course, in the neighboring countries. And I will end up with uh, alternatives, how we can invest in alternatives in transformation for the future. I think uh, I will start with the, with the idea of the Arab Spring, because I think we have a huge increase in our expectations. And at the same time, we have this kind of slab that we have uh, a failure in the Arab Spring and to, to a large extent. And actually, we have a development in reverse. We are not transforming toward anything, toward our future that we dreamed of as a democracy, as, as an, uh, a social justice, as a social cohesion. It's the opposite. So how we can see the, this contradiction but between increasing the hope in one or two years and then we have this kind of deep deterioration. And the, the most importantly, that we have the normalization of grave violations. So our benchmark that have been accepted in 2010 have been deteriorated. So we are now accepting a, a, a tyranny, political tyranny, 
that have been not accepted before. We are accepting a violations for human rights, which we didn't see before. So we are normalizing our life with lower benchmark in terms of human rights, in terms of development, in terms of governance. And unfortunately, this is not just an, a dynamics within this region and within these countries, it's have been accepted globally, which means that we can expect that the deterioration in this region will continue for long term. This is, uh, and that's why we need a substantial alternative. We need something to invest in, not in one country, but across different societies, different actors, to start to understand or to start to start to to build a new movement that could escape from the current degradation. There is four main foundations for the the conflict and for the continuation of it, which is we we said in the center that the institutional suffocations or killing the politics, as Omar said, is the key, is the core of other factors. So the oppression which shifted toward tyranny is the, the main engine of, the, uh, of this kind of intractable conflict. And that's why changing the, the rules of the game in terms of, of, of governance and politics is a key for the transformation toward future but not in the reduced form that we will change the regime within two months or external actor could make this shift. We need an accumulation of internal actors, of culture, of social relations to build this, such an alternative for the future. I will reach it at the end. What happened uh, from political economy point of view that choosing the shift from a political oppression toward a securitization of all sectors in the, the economy, in the social relations, was, I mean, the key in Syria. That started from the regime to invest in identity politics, which we think is another element, very important element for the economy and for the development inside the country, and have been invested from the regime with, to start with, and then from regional countries, which invest in this kind of the importance of hate speech and the importance of refuse the other is very good fuel for the military operations, for the killing, for the violations. So this is a, 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 an angle that has been invested in uh, in the last decade and of course before, but now we have a different level as I mentioned. The conflict economy is something is uh, overlooked many times. Just we look for some names of uh, war, warlords, we look for some drugs dealers or some smuggling. But actually the whole economy changed. The whole structure of the economy, including the productive sector, become in the service of the continuation of the conflict. When the regime, for instance, leave an area for to, to continue the agricultural production, or when uh, a non-state actor continue to allow few people to do their uh, retail and their wholesale activities. It is as an incentive toward the continuation of the conflict, not because they believe that this productive sector is very important for the economy. So even the normal productive sector become part of the conflict economy dynamics and to support the, this kind of resilience of the conflict. The, uh, of course, the, we are talking about external hegemony, which was, we faced as, a, a, which hindered the development in the region. As we, as all of us know, uh, the, this kind of external interventions. You know that the invasion of Iraq changed the landscape of the region and increased the the acceptance of militarization to a large extent, and unfortunately, accept that a failure of the countries and uh, for the long run, like what we see in Iraq as, as, a, as a, a country in a failure state and unfortunately accepted now uh, overall. So what uh, the, the, the dynamics within Syria, we can see that it shifted from an actor who just support one of the actors to an, to an actor who play a substantial role. For instance, the Russian intervention in the economy, it shifted from a slight support 
mainly a military support, but then they come, they come to control the resources, the human resources, and the governance of the economy. Uh, I'll give some simple example. The uh, Russian controlled the gas production in Syria, which is obvious, uh, not just in Syria, but in Syria they have a hands on. Now, the government need the gas because we have a shortage of, of energy. And there is a huge collapse in the economy in the last two years. The Russian refused to give the gas to the government unless they pay the international price. And you know that the oil and gas now, we have a, a huge surge in the, in the international prices. So they start to, to put conditions on their alliances to, because it's now privatized. So you are talking to private company of, of the, which is actually a crony privatized companies, which is located, uh, related to the authority in Russia. So you are controlling the economy and not toward flourishing or giving your alliances a space to, to make a, a high economic growth and increasing accelerating investment is the opposite. I need you at the low equilibrium. So it's a subordination plus low equilibrium. We can see it as for another example, the Turkish intervention in the Northeast. So you can't export to, to the Turk, to Turkish market. And you are my, my, my place, you are my uh, area of influence. There is no space for political and in, uh, participatory governance. It is a dominant governance by, directly by, by the Turkish. And you can't export to the, to the Turkish market. You have to import, of course, from the, Tur from the Turkish companies. And you can't build your, uh, your energy plant. You have to import electricity in the very high prices from private companies from Turkey. So it's kind of building the dependency in a way that I don't want you to flourish and to be a, a strong actor. I want you to be a dependent for long term. And unfortunately, this is, we can give many examples about that, but this is the core of the conflict economy, not the smuggling, which is, has been, I mean, normalized between different actors. It's how the whole production has been shifted toward serving the uh, regional actors at the first place, and secondly, the military and security services at, at, at the second test. What we, we said about the distortion of the institutions, for instance, we have a Ministry of Electricity. This Ministry of Electricity started to participate in a siege for Syrians, or Ministry of Defense that started to, to use the weapons against the Syrian people. This shift in the values of the institutions make a new institutions, a new culture, which is irreversible. We can't bring those people again and tell them, okay, we will come back to the values to serve the public good. This, make, this is the most dangerous issue that affects the institutional settings and the social relations. This is a very important root of the continuation of conflict economy. And we will see it now after the end of the big battle or big military operations. In the last two years, we or let's say three years, we have a, de a decline in the uh, number of uh, killed people because of the direct conflict, and the number of battles, the big battles, and we have like stabilization between state and non-state actors. You can see that in the last two or three years, we have a lot of new factors that come to, to the scene, like the COVID, which affects the glo globally, but also we have a different impl um, uh, implementation of Caesar uh, sanctions with Trump, now it changed with Biden. We have the Lebanese crisis, which is partly affected by the deterioration of the Syrian situation. So we have external, quote unquote, factors that affect the economy. And, and I will add also the, the drought, which has I mean, affected the, the, the agriculture sector and the food security in Syria. But the most important issue that while all the people wait for the decline of the military operations, the economy and the services declined and deteriorated. And this is what we call it, that distortion of institutions. 
the, institution, the institutions built not to serve people, to serve the world elite. And without any accountability, we are talking about sustainability of this elite to exclude, to marginalize people. And now, as, I, as I mentioned, you have now Russian elite and then regime elite. You have Turkish elite and opposition elite. So you have now different layers which is diverted from the priorities of the society. The minimum social support that, that it should be part of any political power have been declined. Now, external support is the first political power foundation, and the second one is the military ability and capacity. These uh, different uh, elements that you can see can explain for us why the Syrians want to go out of Syria. While, I mean, many of the international communities talking about the, the return of refugees, we are talking in our research about Syrians who want to leave. Not because they don't like the economic situation, because they don't see a hope in the future of end of transformation. They fear that, that this political oppression will change into, into a conflict or bigger conflict in any time. If you don't see that and you just look for that the, the violations or the military operations, you will not see that you have the countries that are, that, it's, that are ready for explosion. Like what happened in Lebanon. In Lebanon, all the talk about stability destroyed in just a few months because we don't understand that the political oppression plus the, the, the exploitation by the economic elite lead to uh, uh, a hopeless case for the, for the for young people and for populations. And that's why we have to understand why the people want to leave, not to, to stay. A simple, uh, a simple chart here, I can use this one. As you can see that we are talking about the, the, the collapse of the economy. So this is the GDP, this is 2010 before the social movement. So we reach the point of third of the economy. So we lost two thirds of our GDP. Now this third have been collapsed after the reduction of military operations. We have minus 18% growth rate in 2021. So it's not because of the military operations at all. It is because of the governance of the economy. Of course, there is external factors, but this is not explaining this kind of collapse that we see. And one simple explanation for that, that the people who thought that it is about the military operations, they see it is not about it. So the same behavior, the same policies about energy, about labor, about the protection of property rights, that it decline. That's why you, you see that most of the people who want to invest to have a recovery, they decline. They want to, to go outside the country. So what we are talking about is the continuation of deterioration is something that have been founded and the conflict is not just the military operation, it's, it's the, the elite who are uh, building the policy around it. The, 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 you see that this is the agriculture and the collapse in this, and I think in the next season we will have more rain, so this, this could be, I mean, recover. But the other, like the drop in the manufacturing and the drop in the services, this means that this type of the economy is in a continuation of deterioration and we don't hope to change it. Now, the other side of the picture. I'll just come back to this one to tell you that we have a third of the economy. A substantial part of it is a military expenditure. It's not the economy that it's the value added that we are talking about. The second thing that it depends between 25 to 30 percent of our GDP, the whole GDP for the whole Syria, is uh, uh, international aid from different countries through the UN and outside the UN. So it is a dependent economy. For instance, if the international community decide to reallocate 20% of the subsidies to Syria, to Syria toward Ukraine, you are talking about an acceleration of deterioration. It is not 
a self-sustained third of the economy. It's worse than that. This reflected in the human capital that most of the, of the people start to either working in the informal sector with a very bad conditions or start to be part of the conflict economy activities, which is affecting the skills, the behavior, the relations, and of course, affect the, the uh, development, the sustainable development of the long run. Which is two minutes less as a losses. <laughs> as you can see that when we are talking about the, the that our losses, the, the total accumulation of economic losses is more than 10 times our GDP in 2010. Our loans, now we have, we are, the, the Syrian regime uh, uh, need to, to pay the debt to the Iranian and Russian. The Syrian opposition need to pay the debt for the Turkish. The uh, uh, autonomous administration need to, to pay the debt for the American. So the whole society and actors are in debt, in huge debt for the different actors who play an important role in, in Syria, either from a humanitarian point of view or from a military point of view. So this country, even if now we end all these foundations, is in debt for long term, unless we are, there is a shift in the uh, governance of this, uh, of, of the system that that running the, the Syrian economy. I, I, I can't go, uh, in all these details, but I will give you this example. There's the, this is the de uh, depreciation of exchange rate. So you, you resist as an economy. For instance, here, you start to use your reserves. So you protect your exchange rate from a huge collapse. And then you start, when you lose your reserve, you start to accept the subsidies and support from outside. The people use their savings you use your wealth, the accumulation of wealth, to keep your life at the minimum level. But this cannot continue forever. This collapse that happened between 2019 and 2021 of the exchange rates, of the prices, of the productivity, reflect that these relations, savings, accumulation of experience, reach the point that it cannot be continued. So we are talking about the acceleration of collapse. The people cannot continue in this direction. One example about that, your children and schools. If your children outside of the schools for two years, maybe you can recover. But if they are outside of the school for five years, you don't have a solution for them. You can't bring the, 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 your children with 20 years old and bring it back to the secondary school. This is a huge loss of the human capital that it will reach a point that this generation will be lost for forever. This is what happened in the economy as well. It is the biggest reallocation of wealth in the history of Syria because it's not just destroying the wealth, it's pillage of wealth toward a specific elite in a very quick way. You don't need a, a regulations, you don't need a new uh, a social support. It is a forced reallocation of, of it. I will close this by, by just mentioning this, that although we have a substantial reduction in expenditure, in the public expenditure, we, we still have a huge investment in military expenditure. So, so the savings on the expense of development expenditure, wages and subsidies, not on the military side. So that's why we can understand that they are continuing with the same strategy. They don't see that they have to mitigate part of their strategies because they, they need a sustainable development for their own political stability. It's not the case, unfortunately. Uh, last, that it's uh, a generation of unemployed people. We have an employment rate like uh, uh, of 11% uh, at 2010, we are now between 45 and 50% unemployment rate. Mm. This kind of generation without work, and we have a substantial part of the workers who are part of the conflict economies. We are accumulating a negative human capital in this regard. I think this is a kind of foundations that alert 
that the continuation with the current situation is uh, going to make a new conflict, not just to have a degradation in the economic and social thing. I will end up here and maybe later we'll talk about alternatives, if any. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for the input, but I think before I, I open the floor for discussions, I actually want to ask the two of you for, for you know, a very concrete example of what alternative means in this context. I mean, Omar started with the miracle of, you know, the uprising, and then you stopped here with the, the question of employment. So, so maybe the two of you can mention, like, two very concrete examples of where you see alternatives, or where can they start, and then we can open up to further discussion. Uh, you can remove it when you are talking. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I think uh, we come back to the society. Reinvesting in society is the key. Now, the, the big challenge that we have, that the political opposition, which started in 2011, it was the hope to build the alternative and to be linked to the society. And this is the core of, and this is the strength of this political operation because they don't have a military forces, they don't have money, they don't have institutions. This is the strength of the political uh, uh, opposition and the social movement overall. I think the diversion between the political actors, especially in the opposition side, and the society is the first loss of a core for this transformation. So what we are looking for if for the future is to reinvest in this relation between society and a transformation toward democracy, social justice, and sustainable development. If we don't have this first vision, second, an open public discussion, now we can't open it in some places, but we can open it outside Syria, in some regions, online, we have a lot of opportunity if we want to bring this discussion, to bring this actor again to be an active actor, I think this is the, the, the introduction point. The second part of it, we can't build a political actor without having a different economy. With this economy, we can't have a society that supports sustainable development. We will have a society that supports conflict economy. So changing the investment in the economy, and if we don't want to talk about dreams, if we talk now about food security, we can ch change the, the interventions by the civil society and humanitarian actors in the food security cycle to bring better governance, more social cohesion, more link across the regions and people that will bring a new economic base, which is expanding the actor, what we, which we call the society, or future opposition that represent this, this kind of alternatives and options. So I think this is a starting point, at least to, to see how we can, it's, it's not, uh, uh, it's not short, short term, but it can be started now. Yeah, and I, I mean, just to, to pick up on that, I mean, this is, uh, you know, where I think the, the question of, of going back to not simply to be stuck in that moment, but one of the things that struck me about the, the and that everyone knows about who was involved or who, who studied the movement was the attempt uh, to bridge divides within the country. I mean, there, there were, you know, throughout the, the early months of the uprising, attempts to, uh, there were a lot, lots of things going on. Uh, but one of the things that was going on is an attempt to overcome the fragmentation that resulted I think from this idea of killing politics, that where we don't know what's happening in other regions, how they're being governed, what are the structures there, what are their conditions, and I think that has been lost in a significant way. I mean, I think uh, the significant presence of civil society in the diaspora was actually a perfect opportunity to re re resume that national vision, that national dialogue, in in fact, or instead what has happened is that there's been a reframing, a continuation of the conflict inside the country, but outside the country, right? The fault lines of conflict, rather than being overcome outside the country, they've been recreated. The battle of narratives and the sectarianization and the ident identitarianism has been recreated. So there's, there's the need to actually think about what does it mean to revive a national vision? What does it mean to include economic justice on the agenda? as a key component for thinking about the future. 
Um, uh, what does it mean to overcome this fragmentation? There's a lot, of course, of obstacles to overcome. I mean, fragmentation is one aspect that's dividing the civil society. There's donor-driven agendas or slash lack of autonomy. So either donor-driven agendas or lack of autonomy from the political actors themselves. So that's why the battle is being recreated. Uh, those who are not part of that, they're part of uh, other processes that are very necessary, which is being involved with humanitarian aid, which is, of course, very crucial. But at the same time, it's part of being involved in this newly created dependency. It's a depoliticized version of thinking about the reality and thinking about the alternatives, because it's basically you know, entrenching, not that it's any individual's fault, but it's entrenching this, this dependency. So there's either the wrong kind of politicization or a complete depoliticization. Um, Questions from the audience or like comments, um, please.